It's hot. It's dry. It's the Arizona desert. On this edition of Scientific American Frontiers, we'll see how nature gets by under the most extreme conditions. We'll see how a desert spider has to fight to capture an ant to win a paper. We'll ask what it takes to be the fastest on four legs. We'll find out how frogs and flounder make it through the big trees. And we'll discover the life of the ocean depths and the birds and the dangers of mountain goats. I'm Alan Alden. Join me now as we go to extremes. that are moving the air. And so they can tell what kind of insect that is that's in the vicinity and um, whether they want to come out and attack. They can tell just by the vibrations of the right. web that we're in the air what kind of insect is sitting on their trap. Huh? That's right. These are fire ants. They're tough and aggressive with a nasty bite. Here we go. I'm dropping the ant. Attacks without hesitation. It's a female. Summer is a breeding season, so she has to eat even though she's risking her life in the process. She grabs at it and she goes back. What's she doing? She's trying to avoid the jaws. She's trying to enjoy it. She has to try and get her little tanks that are really small. She has to get her little tanks that are really small. But it's not just the ant that could kill her. The hot desert sun could too. She'd be protected back in the shade, but she can't take her prey in until it's secure and safe to move. Five minutes into the struggle, the sun comes out. As the web rapidly heats up, the spider's forced to retreat to the shade and funnel. It's now over 100 degrees out on the web. How does she know the ant will still be there when she comes back? She doesn't. But she doesn't have a choice, because if she heats up and she goes into the super, she'll die. She'll be in the They're hungry, so they have to cry. She's back within a minute for a quick check on her victim. Now it seems safe to take in. Susan thought she had her desert spiders pretty well figured out, until one day she discovered the spiders who live in this game. The canyons of a lush oasis. So biologists would expect the plane and animal species living here to be different from the ones living in the desert extremes. But to Susan's surprise, the spiders were the same. This launched her on a journey of discovery that still continued and that may eventually lead to a glimpse of evolution itself in action. This is a lot nicer here. And I can see how the spiders feel about it. It's better for us. Yeah, but, yeah, but I, I guess it's, it's cooler. Susan first noticed that even though it's cool here, river spiders often stay in their funnels. They're timid and fearful, unlike their desert cousin. That makes sense, she realized, because under the tree, the enemy's no longer the sun. It's hungry birds. But seeing the same species changing its behavior like this, in a different environment, was a big surprise, an important discovery in biology. 
you see her at all? If she's there, she's back pretty far. I see something in this The threat of the birds stops the river spiders from coming out to fight a tough ant. Anyway, there are plenty of softer insects around. There's a definite lack of interest in this ant here. We're going to ignore the vibratory pattern and the ants go. They're not going to come out. Not worth the trouble because you can get killed that way. Yeah. Susan set up a natural laboratory, an eight acre Both sides of the fence are checked, but most spiders are heading downhill toward the easy life on the river. Oh, what? Well, there's something in here. Oh, let's see. Watch out, there's something in there. Yeah, a cricket or something. What? <laughs> cricket. A cricket and an itsy bitsy spider, and. You never know what it could have been. It could have been a scorpion. Well, you're losing. I don't one. want it back. I emptied it. Oh. You, to, you always have to empty all the insects out. You know. Oh, by, the, by the way, there are scorpions. Uh, there are. There are. There are. There are. Right. Of course there are. What do you think I was screaming? So watch your fingers when you reach in. Nothing. Something. Something. <laughs> yeah, probably another a spider. Cricket. No, no, a spider. Oh, yeah? Yes. What kind? Very aggressive spider. <laughs> That's a spider. Huh. What is it? Well, that is an agile lapsus superior. I told you. Every day, trapped spiders are brought to the lab close to the enclosure. They'll be returned to the wild just across the fence at the point where they were caught to continue their journey. But first, they're put through their paces. This is a test for aggression. Susan has caught and tested every one. Females are kept in the lab until they build webs in their plastic boxes. Then they and the boxes go back into the field with the males. Now the study moves to the next stage. You know exactly where it is? Uh, yes. It's like there's a favorite night spot they go uh, to? No, well, potentially any one of these spiders that is in a box could be mating. I think if you were to look inside that funnel, 
you will see. Here. Yes, you will see that there are two spiders. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's a mating going on between an aggressive dry land male who came down the hill and a timid river female. It would have gone something like this. The male cautiously approaching while doing his mating things to signal his intention to the female. Both spiders have to be careful because things can turn up pretty quickly. A fight could start, especially if male and female are very aggressive. Or if one is too aggressive and the other is too timid. And the timid one might simply run away. into a puzzle. The spiders just aren't behaving right. You see that one that was right there? Yeah. Many spiders are much more aggressive than makes sense here. Susan's figured out they're the hybrid offspring of aggressive dry land males and timid river females. That really seems aggressive. You think that's a hybrid? It's got to be. I mean, here's a spider that obviously is a hybrid. She takes these ants and could kill her into her funnel and she lets them go. Just catching them for yeah. no reason, and no they're reason. dangerous to catch. She probably won't even eat it. Here's the kind of super aggressive behavior by the hybrids that Susan discovered. Dangerous fire ants are pulled into the funnel without first being subdued. Not even a hungry desert spider would take this risk. And sure enough, Susan's found most hybrids to make it. Many are taken by birds. Many don't breed because they scare off their partners. prevents them from mating with aggressive males. The offspring of those females would survive, unlike hybrids. If she's right, she'll see much more of this, a male with no partner. Hey, Terry? You got yeah, I'm at A134, and I have a male. It looks like uh, white, yellow, pink. He was there last check. The female is uh, not here, so he must have chased her off. Susan expects that somewhere there's a timid river female who won't mate with an aggressive male from up the hill. Her offspring will inherit that behavior, they'll thrive, and eventually they'll take over the canyon. They'll never mix with the guys up the hill again. It'll be a shift to a new species of spider, evolution in action. To make that discovery, Susan Reichert's prepared to put in another few decades. Do you ever, at night before you go to sleep, say to yourself, wouldn't it be great if in the next few months I started to see this shift and I, I was there to experience it? Well, we'd all love to have that kind of uh, event happen, um, but that's nature. It does what it wants. Whatever happens, happens, and we can just follow it. <laughs> Thanks to the 
is getting shorter. Um, so the flounder can sense that the, the day length is shortening, uh, winter's approaching, um, and the whole system for making antifreeze proteins is triggered around about November time. Alive and well back at Sally Goddard's lab at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland, this flounder becomes a blood donor. The fish will survive till another day, and its blood will demonstrate the property that makes it so remarkable and potentially valuable. Back into the water. It's pleased to be back. As well as the blood sample she's just taken, Sally has some blood from a flounder caught during the summer. I'm going to set the temperature of the bath to really cold seawater, winter temperature, which is about minus 1.8. That's as cold as seawater gets before it freezes solid. Uh, this is blood taken from a fish in summer. Uh, this fish doesn't have any antifreeze, so it's plasma. Now, once I disturb uh, the blood, ice crystals start to form in the blood, and they propagate very quickly, spread through the blood, and turn it into something looking like a slush puppy, a uh, red slush puppy. Uh, if this was a fish with blood like this, the fish wouldn't be able to breathe, blood wouldn't circulate around the fish. Um, you'd have a dead fish, for sure. But at the same low temperature, the winter flounder's blood stays liquid, thanks to the antifreeze protein. The proteins have a special affinity for ice crystals. So at the first hint of an ice crystal forming, these proteins bind onto it and effectively lower the freezing point. So a fish with high levels of antifreeze is just about protected under any circumstances in Newfoundland waters. Sally Goddard now has a small business purifying the fish antifreeze, anticipating the day when it could be useful to humans as well as flounder. One of her best customers is across the continent in Berkeley, California. Here, Boris Rubinsky looks at what freezing does to living cells. He's hoping to radically improve the availability of human organs for transplant surgery. One would like to be able to preserve organs for long periods of time in order to facilitate the organ transplantation. Uh, there are many organs available, but because of the lack of compatibility in terms of time and placing, one cannot really implant all the available organs. If we would be able to preserve organs for long periods of time, then obviously we could uh, resolve some of these problems. Learning how animals solve their problems is probably, in my opinion, the best way to actually uh, resolve the problem of organ preservation for transplantation. The big problem with preserving human organs is that freezing destroys the cells it's meant to save. This is human blood. As it freezes, the blade-like crystals trap and squeeze the red blood cells. Most of the cells are being pushed to the side by the ice crystals. And all the cells are being pushed inside these channels and compressed, and this is where they are destroyed. The walls become leaky. The cells are not nice and round anymore as they were at the beginning of the freezing process. Adding Sally Goddard's fish antifreeze to the cells not only holds back freezing, even at very low doses, not enough to prevent ice crystals growing. It helps keep red blood cells round and intact. But the fish antifreeze alone won't solve the problem of preserving human organs for transplantation. So Boris Rubinsky's conviction that nature will teach him how to freeze then bring back to life human tissue has led him beyond fish to an even more remarkable winter survivor. It's hunted in the woods of Ontario every year by Carleton University biologists Janet and Kenneth Story. It's a lot of hard work. It makes you wonder why a middle-aged scientist is wandering around the woods taking leaves. Like my mother says, that the good news is my son is a doctor and the bad news is he's the wrong kind. I end up looking for frogs. That's what? Oh! They're here to catch, or attempt to catch, Wood frogs. Oh, beauty. Whoops. Obviously, still quite active in the late fall, the frogs are approaching a long, hard Canadian winter. This is an adult wood frog. This looks to be a female. You can see that her abdomen is quite extended. She's already got the eggs in place that she will lay in the spring at the breeding ponds. In the jar with her. Okay, Jay, here's one. And during that winter, like everything around them, 
they'll simply freeze solid. This is probably a young of the year. That is, he was a tadpole months ago. He's been eating flies and things ever since. And now, if we didn't disturb him, we'd just burrow down and live frozen all winter underneath the leaves. If you're frozen, your metabolism slows down to nothing, and you can live in a state of suspended animation. Instead of having to grow huge and eat a lot of fuels and then use them up, if you're frozen for many months, you're not using your fuels. In the spring, they come out before there's any insects to eat, and they mate and lay eggs in ponds that are still covered with ice. For these frogs, winter is coming a little early this year. Uh, what we're doing here is getting ready to freeze the frogs at what is a natural temperature to them, about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The freezer may not be as comfortable as a forest floor, but once the temperature starts falling, the frogs settle down tuck themselves in, and over the course of several hours, freeze solid. crystals on the skin, and the frog can't even be flexed at all. For Ken and Janet's story, only one thing is more entrancing than watching a frog freeze, and that's watching it thaw. First thing that you can see in a newly thawed frog is the heart beginning to pump blood. The thickened blood is now being pushed back into the exterior limbs and around the brain to get the frog This wood frog is now in Boris Rubinsky's lab, where it's about to be frozen while its insides are imaged by an MRI scanner of the type usually used in hospitals. As soon as ice forms on its skin, a wood frog starts pumping out huge quantities of the blood sugar glucose from its liver. Like the fish antifreeze, glucose seems to both lower the freezing point and protect cells from damage when ice does start forming. And in the MRI images, where frozen tissue appears darker, it's the triangular-shaped liver, the source of the glucose, that freezes last. But what Rubinsky is especially intrigued by is how the frog unfreezes, because if it thaws as you'd expect from the outside in, then its limbs and head would unfreeze before the heart and so begin to die through lack of blood. The MRI explains the mystery as it reveals that the frog thaws evenly throughout its body. Now, nature has somehow ensured, essentially through glucose, as we found later, it has assure, ensured that the whole frog thaws simultaneously throughout all its tissues, and therefore, as soon as it thaws, the blood circulation perfuses all the tissues and brings them back to life simultaneously, and the frog can begin hopping. Copying nature's solutions to surviving extreme cold, perhaps one day human organs will freeze and come back to life with the same unconcern as the wood frog. It's a race we've all seen on television. Right.
animals run is a fascination of University of California Berkeley physiologist Roger Crum. I got interested in studying locomotion because uh, that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy exercising and running myself. Um, but uh, I think what the most interesting thing about animals is, is that they move. Crom is especially intrigued by the extremes of animal locomotion and the limits, like gravity, that set those extremes. The ant is a very small animal. It's not very fast in absolute terms, but it, even though it moves its legs very quickly, it has short little legs. Ants, uh, however, are na no danger of breaking their legs. They're so small, gravity is not an important force for them. The elephant, on the other hand, is really dominated by gravity. It's, uh, it's huge. It has, can take enormous strides, but it uh, can't run because if it started to run and left the ground and landed, it would uh, literally break its bones. The cheetah is a spectacularly successful compromise between the lightness of the ant and the power of the elephant. Here at the Phoenix Zoo, Roger is at the very beginning of a research project that he hopes will reveal the secret of the cheetah's speed. He's about to film a chase, not between a cheetah and an antelope, but between a cheetah and a rabbit's foot at the end of a very long line. suburbs, where I recently helped out in a mini roundup at Harvard University's field station. How did they get the ability to go this fast in the first place? Well, historically, up until the time of the Pleistocene, about 10,000 years ago, there was a cheetah in North America, and we could argue that perhaps they co-evolved such that uh, predation from this very fast cat then led to their escape mechanism being development of high speed themselves. When did the cheetah check out? The cheetah checked out about 10,000. So for 10,000 years they've had this ability. I mean, they're all dressed well, up and no well, place to go. Jim Jones, like Roger Crumb, is setting out to answer the basic question. How are these animals able to achieve speeds, as does the cheetah, that are simply far, far in excess of what almost every other mammal is able to do. What have you found so far? How can they run so fast? Well, we look at it in a very general sense as two possibilities. One is either the animals have a very large motor, which is their metabolism and how much energy is available to fuel the running, or alternatively, maybe they have a specialized transmission. 
It's the pronghorn's transmission, the way it converts its motor power to speed. That's about to be checked out today. Judah is being chased down a corridor past an observation port manned by Jim Jones student Seth Wright. Okay, that's good. We got a right. We got a right rear. Let's go, Judah. The aim is to get Judah to step on a plate that will measure the force behind each stride at the same time that a high-speed video camera records it. Let's go, girl. Come on, Judah. Finally, they get a perfect shot of a rear leg in action. One of the most dramatic features is that they have these, these huge extensions at the ankle, which is in the same place as the knee of the human. It's the first joint, major joint off from the ground. That means that the muscle is acting very far from the joint, and that gives it a great deal of leverage, akin to pushing on the side of the door far from the hinge, because you a great deal of leverage to open or open the door. The ankle lever allows the prong to leap into its run with the acceleration it once needed to keep one step ahead of North American cheetahs. the strongest arrangement for a bone. It's not undergoing any bending as it strikes. So these antelope aren't compromising safety to achieve their high speeds. Walk this way. Walk. Judah's companion, 4x4, four four, will also be getting a workout today. In her case, though, not to test her transmission, which seems in fine shape, but to run a detailed check on the motor. Ready, we will stick this mask on her. Uh, which will collect the gases that she's expiring as she's running. So, this is the mask. This must be the ultimate in recycling. An old whisk bottle. The treadmill is cranked up and 4x4 four four is off and running with a little encouragement. Now, look behind her. That'll be enough to show what it is. Yeah, you can see that. that. No, the horizon are looking behind her. I see. How long can she keep going like this at this speed? At this speed, forever. She, she just go on and on at this, this speed. Is so easy a big for her. This, this is one tenth of what she can do. A force plate under the pronghorn's front legs records her gait, which is displayed as she trots by the red line. The green line is her breathing, one breath for every three steps. Now she's going up to eight. This will be about 18 miles per hour. At this speed, 4x4 four four breaks into an easy gallop. But to keep going at over 20 miles an hour, she really needs to feel there's a cheetah on her tail. By now, her breathing pattern has changed. Instead of three strides per breath, at a gallop, her stride and breathing rate seem to be locked together. The question that's been raised about that is, might it be that every time the animal's body goes forward in the stride, hits down as it begins to momentarily slightly decelerate before the next stride goes forward, and the inertia, the momentum, as it were, of the guts going forward would push the air out of the lungs a little bit, and then as the animal accelerates forward, the inertia causing those guts to move backward a little bit might help it to inspire. For an animal its size, the pronghorn has huge lungs. And it could be, then, that the gallop itself is helping her take the great gulps of air she needs to keep going. To run the pronghorn's motor even harder, the angle of the treadmill is cranked up to a grade of 20%. Now it's Judah's turn. She seems to be looking forward to it. As Judah sets off uphill, Jim Jones summarizes what makes her and her kind such extraordinary athletes. The largest single part of it is that, indeed, the animal has a huge motor. She has got muscles that are designed to utilize oxygen at a rate uh, that's about five times as much as a not highly aerobic athletic animal like a goat. To support that, she has to have a very high ability to pump blood from the lungs to the muscle. So she's got an extremely large heart, very, very large for her size. And in turn, to get the oxygen from the air into that blood, she's got the lungs that we mentioned earlier that are much, much larger, uh, about two and a half times larger than those of the less aerobic animal.
visitors to these hidden depths, the submarine Ventana. What is all this stuff here? Well, we've got a variety of tools that we use in depth. These are samplers that we use to collect the more fragile and delicate animals. Uh, down here is the big eye. Up here along this uh, middle bar are four metal halogen lights. The depths we'll be working at today are very dark less than a hundredth of a percent of uh, the sunlight which reaches the surface penetrates as deep as we'll be working. If we were down there without a light, what would it be like? Would it would be like being in a room that just has a tiny crack in a, somewhere under a door? Or even less than that. The only thing you can see is that looking up towards the surface is less dark than looking there. Bruce Robeson has been using the Ventana to explore the darkness below for some seven years now. In a sense, the creatures down here are like aliens. Look at this guy. This Adapted to an side. environment quite unlike the one the rest of us who live on Earth inhabit. But, but this has this big plate at the end. This creature is called a siphonophore. Uh, propulsive animal. And there are two swimming belts, one on either side, that allow the animal to pull itself in water. In fact, the siphonophore may not be a single animal at all, but an assembly of many. Until it was seen here in its habitat, up in a net, could you? No. We would have had only bits and pieces. We wouldn't have known how many siphonophores uh, were there, whether it was one or a hundred. These animals get to be extraordinarily large. We have measured them up to 120 feet long. That's a very big surprise. And it makes it one of the longest creatures on Earth. Capturing siphonophores and the deep's other gelatinous creatures in one piece is a job for one of Ventana's specialized collection devices. We're going to put them up the uh, vacuum cleaner there? That's right. We're going to uh, draw this siphonophore into the suction sampler so that we can uh, look at its stomach content. 
Okay. You can get a big guy like that into one of your containers, sure, and he won't break. It will be, um, what's the polite term? Wadded up. <laughs> okay, we're going to give. We're gonna this is why I don't believe in flying saucers coming down <laughs> and taking samples of humanity. I don't want to be wadded up by one of those people. <laughs> The siphonophores gently sucked the board in one piece, accompanied by some of the dust-like particles that are everywhere down here. What's all this snow-like stuff we're seeing around the animal? You called it by the right name. We refer to it as marine snow. It's sort of all of the all of the junk and detritus and and, uh, and dust of the upper layer of the ocean. So that's stuff falling off of animals up above and it passes through this region and continues on its way all the way down to the bottom? That's right. And, 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 and animals are feeding on it all the time? Yes. Uh, certainly bacteria feed on it while it descends, but there are other animals, filter feeders, that occur in midwater, and they process these particles. But eventually they all reach the sea floor. Since Bruce Robeson and his colleagues began their deep water explorations, they've identified dozens of new species. Creatures down here range from the gruesome fang tooth to the angelic looking ribbon fish. Some 2100 Ventana passes through a layer where oxygen levels are very low. Among the creatures adapted to hanging out here is the splendidly named Vampirotuthus infernalis, a distant cousin to octopus and squid. It glares at us balefully through a huge blue eye. Oh boy, time out. This is a barrel of pitted. It's a very, very beautiful little fish that we don't see all that often. Its nose is up, it's keeping itself almost vertically in the water column. It's looking up, trying to see its prey silhouetted against the, the surface. Very soon, it's going to take off and it'll be, it'll be gone just like it vaporized. Here he goes. He's history. To evade shadow stalkers like the paralipidid, potential prey are often transparent. Or like this little fish, they generate their own Unfortunately, my own curiosity had begun to lose its battle for attention with my stomach. I think I have to go up and get some air. Okay. It's not that this isn't fascinating, but I think staying in one piece is more fascinating. <laughs> Certainly more enjoy. And with the light of air, it's hard to believe it could just be long and slow as the air is strained and light of the frontier. Pioneers like Bruce Robeson will be exploring its mysteries.
get so sick their lives are in danger. It's an all too common sight for the mountain guides. sickness. This young man named Arndt is one of a group of volunteers willing to push their bodies to the limit to help find a test that will tell people before they climb if they're likely to get sick. Arndt's testing begins by finding out how fit he is. As he works harder, his body responds by increasing his heart rate, pumping more blood to his muscles and so supplying them with more oxygen to burn. To get that extra oxygen into his blood, he breathes faster and more deeply. Now the real test begins. Arndt's oxygen is cut back, simulating high altitude. The idea is to see how he responds when there is less oxygen available. Again, his heart rate increases, and again his breathing gets faster and deeper. At the equivalent of 15,000 feet, Arndt is breathing five times more air than usual, even at rest. This is Michael, another of the volunteers for the test. On the fitness test, he's as good as Arndt. But when Michael's oxygen is reduced, there's a curious difference. At a simulated 15,000 feet, Michael's breathing is little different from what it was at normal altitude. Even during moderate exercise, his body, unlike Arndt's, seems to be ignoring the fact that his oxygen supply is dropping. The Heidelberg researchers wondered if people like Michael, whose bodies don't seem to recognize they're getting into trouble when oxygen is scarce, might be the ones most susceptible to mountain sickness. There was one way to find out. And perched at 15,000 feet on the Italian Swiss border is the perfect laboratory. Test results 
also suggested he cope by breathing harder. He's in trouble. The way I came up, I was feeling quite good, but to my nose, it was developing a big headache. And I was, it was a, a stomach ache. And it was the, I, I had to vomit. All he wants now is rest. My body is exhausted, and I have to sleep. So I hope that I will have a good night. Knowing the dangers of the night, Berch makes regular checks. At 5.30 a.m., the only one complaining is Udo. Udo has a lot of problems. Uh, he was vomiting once at night and he had a headache. I gave him some drugs and uh, symptoms went away. He didn't feel nauseated anymore. Neither Udo nor Berch knows that his test predicted his breathing should adjust to the altitude. But if it has adjusted, it hasn't been enough to prevent his worsening symptoms. Art, meanwhile, as predicted, is still doing fine. His balance is good, his blood oxygen normal. Now I feel good, only uh, tired. He would love to climb the Dufelspitz or any other mountain here. I think he's actually enjoying himself here. That's my impression. Which leaves Michael, who is definitely not enjoying himself. His pre-climb test suggested he wouldn't adjust his breathing to the altitude. And he is now very sick. <laughs> the problem with him was he didn't call us last night when he went to bed. He already realized that something was wrong. And no one called us. And when I saw him this morning, he was really in a severe condition. I think if we had caught him earlier, we could have uh, stopped the process at an early level. Michael's decision to tough out the night could have been a fatal error. <laughs> I didn't notice twice that I was getting worse and worse. So I just, uh, just in the morning, it half past five, say, uh, wake me up. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. You couldn't, were you having trouble breathing? Did it feel like you couldn't breathe? Or what? Yeah, I couldn't breathe and I couldn't walk and I couldn't stand on my feet. It was extremely bad feeling. X-rays show Michael has advanced pulmonary edema. The lace-like pattern in his lungs, especially the right, means they are filling with fluid. This means that we have a very severe illness. If we do not treat Michael, he's most likely going to die. Fluid will accumulate in all his lung, and he will eventually drown. And we have to immediately install treatment by giving oxygen now and fly him down as soon as possible. The oxygen will stabilize Michael's condition for a while. But the only way to clear the fluid from his lungs is to get him off the mountain fast. A rescue helicopter was called in from Zermatt, Switzerland. Visit us online. Scientific American Frontiers can be found on the World Wide Web at the address on your screen. Presentation of Scientific American Frontiers is made possible by a grant from GTE Corporation. And GTE, it's amazing what we can do together.
transcript of this program, send $5 to Scientific American Frontiers, 70 Coolidge Hill Road, Watertown, Massachusetts, 02172. Be sure to specify which episode you'd like. Oh, <laughs>